Well, I'm going to do something a little crazy and start with a bunch of demos. Um, and so I want to start by talking about tinkerability. So, and, and wild humans too, and how do you design things for these, for these situations? What's, what's really, what does tinkerability really mean? So let's just take a couple demos, for example. Uh, let's take this Makey Makey, and let's look at the low floor of the Makey Makey. So this is all unhooked, and I'm just gonna plug it in. And once I plug it in, these lights flash, and once the lights flash, I start hooking it up. So I'm gonna hook the ground wire up, and now I'm gonna hook up one more wire to the right arrow of the Makey Makey. So now I have the ground wire and the uh, right arrow hooked up. And I just grabbed this off someone's table. Sorry if you're still drinking it, but I'm just gonna pour the rest of this mug root beer into this cup. And now I'm gonna uh, just drop the yellow into here. And I'm hoping that my PowerPoint presentation will advance when I touch the mug root beer, and it does. <laughs> okay, now no peeking. Um, and now, uh, now just to get a back arrow, I'm gonna hook up another uh, alligator clip to the back arrow. And I'm just gonna stick that into this orange. It had a little tiny bite out of it. I don't know what you're doing with that out there on that table, whoever is eating that. It doesn't really make sense, but you're kind of eating it. And now let's see if I can go back. Oh, it came unplugged. The ground came unplugged. And so it did. Thank you, sir. And so now back and forward and back and forward. So that's PowerPoint, which is what I was already doing, but what if I want to do something I'm not already doing? Well, let's see, what is really tinkerability really is the ability to do lots of things all at once and just change it around and not get stuck thinking too much. So let's say you Google for uh, webcam uh, photo taker. So this is what you get if you do that. And if you click on the little camera icon, you get a little photo, okay? So that makes sense. So um, let's see, how do I go back? There's not enough room on my screen. There it is, back, okay. So now let's say we wanna do another thing with this. Well, I just hover the mouse over this photo taker, and now instead of hooking up to left and right arrow, I'm gonna take those alligator clips out, and I'm gonna hook one up to this button over here that says click. This button right here says click, so I hook up to click, and now I should be ready to take a photo, but I need help because this is gonna be a high five photo booth, so I need Dale back up here. So I'm gonna hold one of these, Dale's gonna hold the other one, and then theoretically, when we high five each other, it'll take our picture. <laughs> so yeah, you hold that one and you touch that metal with your thumb. Okay. Okay, and now uh, if we don't have dry skin, oh, it just took my picture, come a little closer. <laughs> we have to hit back. Okay, now act like you're stoked. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Dale. That was perfect. <clears throat> Okay, so with this, we've got a low floor. We've got really wide walls. The ceiling's high, but I don't care about the ceiling. Let's throw away the, the high ceiling. Let's get this, you can start right away. You plug and play. There's no drivers pre-installed. You just plug it in and go. And let's talk about wide walls. Well, slideshow advancers, kind of corporate, high five photo booths, kind of like a wedding. People spend hours setting up photo booths where you can take pictures at weddings or parties. This is literally just, just Google something and then you plug it in. Um, let's look at some other stuff. This is how I learned to design for tinkerability was by designing Scratch. So here's another live demo. Um, Scratch was, the PI for that is Mitch Resnick at MIT Media Lab. Now let's look, what, what, what can you do with Scratch? Uh, let me just click the move button. I just launched this, if I click move, it does something. Let me drag that out. Now I can click it here. I can add something else like turn. Okay, click that. I can snap them together, and I could get another block out, like forever, that's a great block, and let me just click that one. Okay, I've got something going now, okay. Now, what does it mean for something to be tinkerable? Well, I can pull that out, I can put it back in. Everything's just going, I don't recompile or anything like that. Um, now, what else can we do with that? Let me bring that guy back out. Now, let me just get the pen out, and I can just stamp. So let's see, stamp is down here. And I'm just gonna drop that in while it's running, and now I've got some other stuff going on. Okay, so it's kind of tinkerable. And I'll just add some more stuff. Let's say under looks, I'll just say change color. Okay, so I'm just dropping stuff in, and under sensing, I'll just add in, instead of moving by 10, let's move by oh, 30. Let's just change that number. Okay, that's a little bigger. And I'm just gonna add in one more thing. How about a sensor for loudness? So instead of moving 30 will move a variable depending on the microphone hooked up to the laptop. So now if I'm really quiet, it doesn't move that much. But if I make a lot of noise, it starts to move a lot. And so I, and I can take these things in and out. I take them all out, now it's just moving. I drop them back in. Maybe I don't want it to turn, I just want it to move. 
drop the turn back in up here, take the move out, now it's just turning over in the corner. That's tinkerability. And, and you can only design for that if you really prioritize it and deprioritize other things like fancy graphics or uh, how, how advanced you can get with this. Let's forget about that. First get tinkerability in there. Let's look at another tinkerability platform. This one I designed with Eric Rosenbaum. It's called Singing Fingers and it's for iOS. So with Singing Fingers, you launch it and pretty much right away you get a blank white sheet of digital paper. And what you can do with it is you can sing into it like this. And then you can touch those things and play it back out. And you can make other sounds into it. Uh, do, do, do. And uh, you can say words into it like uh, maker. And this is really granular. This is not multiple choice stuff here. This is like paper. So you can just drag your finger across that. And you can really just go with it. So this is really granular and there's no rules to this. There's no direction. It's not closed ended. It's divergent for divergent thinking for wild humans. And um, with, a pro with projects like these, you can really easily do open ended projects. You guys have heard of open ended. It's all the rage, right? Well, projects aren't just open ended. There's other openness to projects. Projects can be open beginning, open middled, open ended. Let's take a look at that. So what is an open ended project? Well, that's something where you don't say how it should end. So everyone's project should be different in an open ended project. But when you finish a project, where does it go on to live after that? Well, when you finish a project, do you take it apart? Do you put it in a museum? Do you hang it on the refrigerator? Do you give it to a friend? That needs to be something that's considered when you're designing a workshop for somebody. What happens at the end? That's called prologue. So if you decide for somebody how it ends, that's called uh, closed prologue, and that's okay. Uh, but you could also have open prologue. Um, you can also have open beginnings projects. So, you know, um, how are we going to start off this workshop? Well, um, maybe we're going to start off where uh, in instead of uh, everybody starting with the same materials, we're going to go find materials. So everyone starts with different materials now. That's called open beginning. How did those people get to your workshop or your school? Were they uh, forced to go there by somebody? Did they choose to go there? That's the prologue before it even begins. So you got to think about the middle, the prologue, the beginning whether these things are open or not, and it affects how people learn a lot. So this is really important for schools um, and for your workshops and, and learning environments. Okay. So those are my demos for now. <clears throat> and now we're going to go to a little quiz. Pop quiz, guys. What is the maker movement? Okay, A, B, no. Okay, this is horseshit. This is a multiple choice pop quiz. Do not let me sucker you into thinking that way. This is not how human beings with live in spirits deal with the world. Uh, if anyone presents you with something like this, don't pay attention. Get out of there. This is not a real question. Um, this is not granular. There's not, there's not details. You can't use your intuition. There's nothing there. It's empty. Uh, there's, you know, 0.001% of the time you might want to do something like that. Um, so here's another pop quiz. What is snow? And uh, here's that answer to that through the eyes, imagine through the eyes of a one-year-old, happens to be my one-year-old, and in this that? case, um, he's never seen snow. snow before, and he doesn't, you know, he has all these questions that aren't really verbal, because he doesn't really have language, totally, so feels cold, it's kind of uh -huh. crunchy, so through the eyes of a beginner, what you might call beginner's mind, these questions are more embodied, uh, more in your intuition. What is pollen? Well, okay, again, this person's never seen pollen before. Um, what are those long tendrils? What can you make out of it? What does it feel like? What happens if I squish it around and smash it against each other? This is what the most advanced scientists and the most advanced artists are doing with the world we live in, is asking these questions without already knowing the answers. We don't know how everything works already. What is an escalator? Okay, well, here's one. Uh, what's that? Well, that's an M&M. &M. Okay, we already know what those two things are, right? But if you combine them by accident, like if it falls out of your pocket, then maybe it's not an escalator, it's kind of more of a wave or a surfboard, so you could throw some other stuff down on it. It's like chapstick surfboard. Um, or what are flies, right? You know what flies are, right? They're bugs, so we already know what these things are. 
Uh, I was standing in my backyard. Uh. And they listened to you. I didn't know this, but it was just by accident. And we were really shocked, so we were playing beep, around beep, with it. Beep, beep. And I hear I tell my wife, hey, I don't have a high pitched voice, so. Um, and, and so after that, well, we're like, okay, let's play them a song. Can we get a little more volume? So I read this book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And, um, and he's a Toltec, uh, which is a shamanic tradition from South America. So he's a Native American in a lineage. And the theory that he puts in there that I really like is that humans can be domesticated and also undomesticated. And the process by which the domestication happens is that when you're young or when you don't have the ability to kind of ward off these suggestions that people make to you, people make suggestions to you and you accept them. You accept, you agree with that. Someone tells you something and you agree, that's how the world works. And you forget that and you go on living your life that way. Well, he says you can go through that checklist and uncheck those boxes and not agree with those things if you don't want to, and then you can decide how the world works for you. And he calls that an undomesticated human. And I took that, and I started thinking of it as a wild human. And if you don't believe that, um, that this happens to you, maybe you're a, you know, you're a man, and so you, didn't, you don't listen to suggestions like that or something, look at the intro to, or I, I mean, if you just think you don't, look at the intro to, Stop uh, crying. Stop the, the mask Don't cry. Pick yourself up. Stop which is a new movie. Emotion. Don't be a pussy. Don't let nobody disrespect you. Be cool and be kind of a dick. You always keep your mind. Nobody likes a tattletale. Bros come before hoes. Don't let you women run. All these things and much more are said to young males before they even know what those things even mean. And they take them in. They don't even really know how to think about it. And the same is true of all genders and all kinds of uh, people in all kinds of situations. And we live with these things and we carry them as we go throughout the world. Well, Here's masks being torn off in a Pink Floyd video called Brick in the Wall. This idea of us wearing a mask and it being affected by school and youth when you're kind of unprepared for these suggestions is kind of universal. So I teach this class about how to uh, help people learn so that you can teach them as wild humans. And the class is called Radical Design for Learning. Up on the top, you have your learning saints, Eleanor Duckworth, Henry David Thoreau, Ivan Illich, Maria Montessori, um, John Taylor Gatto, uh, it, it goes on. And so let's look at one, some of these schools are still this pretty much organized on factory lines. Three minutes. Uh, ringing bells, separate so facilities. This is someone you're familiar with. Uh, specialized into separate Ken subjects. A, uh, Sir Ken Anderson. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. He talks about uh, humans in school as being manufactured. And you can see this elsewhere in a Pink Floyd video here. The same exact idea. There's the masks are still on in this scene, so it's out of order. The secret of Here's Maria Montessori talking. is to regard the child's intelligence as a fertile field in which we can sow the seeds of learning, which will blossom under the flaming sun of her imagination. Each of these people contributed so much to what the idea of real, a real school or a real learning situation could look like. Um, we don't have to reinvent schools for wild humans. We don't have to reinvent school. It's been reinvented by all these people over the last couple of centuries or, or even in the last thousand years, but the ones I have video are the last couple of centuries. One of the things Maria Montessori contributed really strongly for me is stations. So if you want to set up a situation uh, for learning, uh, don't, don't broadcast. All time in classroom is spent sitting at a desk, your own desk, everyone sits at their own desk, and there's a chalkboard or a presentation or maybe a worksheet or something like that. Most of time is spent that way. So set up stations where people can go around, freely move their own bodies around, not be more or less chained to a desk, and go try things out. <laughs> So that's Paulo Freire. He says, I'm for a pedagogy of curiosity, the question and not the answer. And Freire's book summed up in a sentence which someone will probably kill me, um, which is called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, says that don't teach people facts. Don't teach people things. Teach people 
about the boundaries and the oppressions that are around them and teach them to see those. That's all people need. It's way more important than learning some history or something. So teach people about what's around them um, and how they can get out of it. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak. When you Make knowledge out of experience. Knowledge comes from experience, according to John Holt. And John Holt is the coiner of the term unschooling. And unschooling, after John Holt took it, went to a lot of places, and Grace Llewellyn was one of those people. Learning to learn how to think. We're out of, out of order, sorry. Learning to Waking learn them up. Let's go Better. to... The teacher is doing okay. something to this girl. The girl is not conscious. She doesn't have a consciousness. He says the teacher's doing something, the girl's not conscious, she doesn't have a consciousness. The way the thing is being taught is taking away your own volition to move through the world. Here's an Eleanor Duckworth activity called going to the movies. In going to the movies, you, uh, the question is, show all the ways that you, four people could sit in four movie theater seats. And you show them with paper clips. And here's one of the people's answers to that. They showed every single way they could sit in the seats. And what? Eleanor teaches you, which she never states, so I'm probably doing harm by stating this, is she teaches you that what you should be interested in as a teacher is the process by which someone thinks through these. She has a book called The Having of Wonderful Ideas. She has a second book called Tell Me More. How do you have wonderful ideas in a teacher-student relationship? You don't give them any ideas, you tell them to tell me more. So when, when someone's laying these solutions out, tell me more about that one, tell me more about that one. That curiosity in you as a teacher about the vast multitudes of the way someone could solve a problem. This isn't, there's not just one way to solve this. You might have been told only one way, but there are hundreds of ways. And as you carry out the exercise, you start to realize that. This is the, um, a handbook for liberating teenagers written by Grace Llewellyn, which is what I was trying to go to before. And she also runs this Not Back to School camp where I'm a counselor. And this is a place that starts the same time school starts. So you go there when everyone else is going to school and you learn how to learn on your own with each other. And notice she calls it a gathering down there at the bottom. So gatherings like Burning Man, like festivals, even like parades in your community, these are places to learn. So I went through my own process of trying to figure out what it meant to be a wild human being. Here's a little documentary that I made about where food comes from. I got in with these urban harvesters, some people call them dumpster divers, and this is about eight years ago. And um, here we're harvesting uh, oil from a restaurant called The Middle East, um, which is coincidental, but it's not that kind of oil. It's a falafel restaurant. And here we're taking the food back into the basement of the um, dormitory at Bexley. And this is what we get, and people buy into a box each month, um, and they get whatever we get, so it's a, um, uh, a model whereby you pay in and you get whatever is harvested, which has a name. <laughs> <laughs> Community supported agriculture model. <laughs> um, and here I, I started designing technology for, uh, for the dumpsters uh, to see whether they're open or closed. This is a squatter's alarm to help people be notified if someone's entering their squat. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what are wild human beings? How do you design for them? Um, here's a clip that has audio, but it's not playing, that's okay. And so I tried to find who else is studying this. So here is Anne Spurn, a professor at MIT. She's studying urban landscape architecture, and, and how can the city be thought of as nature, basically? And so, you know, uh, landscape architect, architects already s study this stuff. So I was going around with one of her students. Here's a cross section, there's a courtyard in the middle, and the student went around, licked his finger, and held it up in the air at each point, and drew an arrow at each point, and in the middle is a kind of a vortex with an X there. I'm like, I've gotta know what's at that X, and so I went to see what's there, and I took a picture of it, and it was amazing. It's everything and nothing at the same time, and the map explains why this thing is there. And that's invisible. And so I wanted to learn to see this kind of invisible stuff, and I started making tools for that. Here's a heat mapped, uh, you know, temperature to color uh, map made of just some Pico crickets with four different colors, and that's a hot laptop in a cold room, and you can see the temperature gradient. Um, and so I thought, what if I could make a camera that can take pictures of this invisible stuff? So I started to make a camera. This is actually cut out of cherry wood. And making a camera is really hard, um, but those are all the holes to route the wires through. And uh, here's one of the lenses that snaps onto the front. That's, if you don't know, that's a light-dependent resistor, so that's a light-sensing lens. And here's the motherboard. I was just learning to solder. I didn't know a lot about how to w route wires and things like that, so I just kind of went nuts on it. And here's the lens cover made of a magnifying glass, because this thing is supposed to help you see the invisible. So the battery covers are made of lenses. And, and here's the idea, mapping 
inputs to outputs. Let's listen to carbon dioxide and let's wander around and take pictures of that in, a, in an audio sense. And so I tested this camera for the invisible with swappable lenses and viewfinders. And I found that people really couldn't tinker with it. People could discover new things and see the invisible, but they couldn't really make new things. So the question I had was, how can you give someone a tool that has a forcing function of looking around and changing the world, making people touch the world and reconfigure it? Can you make a tool like that? Um, so uh, due to time, I will skip ahead to This was the first tool that I made along these lines. This is called the Draudio. This tool encourages you to touch the world, but also to alter the world. So here it's thumbtack into a pencil. As soon as you thumbtack into a pencil, you can start drawing music. Graphite is conductive. You can take that same circuit and move it to a paintbrush. Water is conductive, so the path between the finger and the paintbrush bristles uh, determines the pitch that it makes. Leather is a really good uh, thing to hold water or paint. If you ever need to paint, just paint on a leather couch. The kitchen sink is made of metal. The water has electrons that flow through it even as the water flows. And really lots of things in your world are conductive, and so you can really start to make instruments out of all kinds of things. Well, so I, what did people do when I put this out? I workshopped it. Here's a girl in Taiwan who made a mushroom organ out of some electrical tape, hot glue, and some resistors. And here's a young man from MIT who made a Stradio, which is a resistor ladder that makes different sounds as you drink. And here is a hula looper. Um, this was made by um, a young woman at Not Back to School Camp. And can I get it to play? No, not right now. That's okay. Um, and, and professional designers were using this. This is the synth slicer and the musical puppet. Um, and then I started to wonder, can you make something like this, but it hooks up to the digital world? So that's where Makey Makey came from. And if you haven't seen, here's just a couple of examples of how Makey Makey works. So like I showed before, you just hook it up and it acts like a keyboard. This is just Play-Doh put on a regular notepad. And graphite, like we saw before, is conductive, so you can really draw out uh, any kind of user interface you want, and it just works right, right there. <laughs> if you do try this, you will cut your toes, because I did. There's my son again. And last, the uh, cat bowl selfie. Cat's pads are conductive and their tongues, but not their fur. So what did people do when we put this out there? I'm just gonna show you some of the examples that I've recently seen. That was the Star Spangled Banner by Eating Lunch. He won the talent show. I mean, my YouTube logo. Uh, this is Minecraft. This is actually at the Exploratorium. <laughs> you can make cat toys. Notice only the mouth is conductive there. This guy had a whole dinner party for about eight hours. He has this 30 minute long video explaining his dinner party. And you can do simple stuff too, right? If there's a game with an interface, you can make literal interface for that. This guy wanted to have like a bass guitar on his guitar, but they're really expensive to buy, like really, really expensive. So he just taped quarters to his guitar. I don't actually understand how this works, but somehow the sawdust is conductive. If anyone knows what's going on, let me know, but it's kind of cool. This is nice because there's the copper tape on the beach ball, but the beach ball's bouncy, so it has a nice interface affordance for that. So I'll just skip ahead here. Um, and we already saw Singing Fingers demoed. And so I'm just gonna close out by telling you what's up uh, right now, just really quickly. Last year I showed this top image. Uh, I don't know if anyone, does anyone remember seeing that top image last year? It's pretty obscure, it was on the screen for a few seconds. That was Joy Labs when I got it. Uh, and that was a couple days before uh, this event last year. 
And so it was just empty. And now uh, it's completed. And so that bottom image is what it looks like. Um, that's the company that we make Makey Makey out of. So this was some 3D drawings that I did ahead of time to try to plan it out. And this is what it actually ended up looking like. There's kind of a tree pathway when you enter with rocks, a, a real rocks under your feet and a grassy area in the middle. And when you enter through the doorway, which you can see at the back right in the middle of that mural, when the door opens, you're walking into this kind of explosion uh, of some shape or something like that. And we wanted to have these movable pieces on, on the grass and on the carpet, so we made them out of felt, and there they actually are uh, in real life. And then I moved to Florida. I sent this card out to my friends, and uh, my family decided we wanted to live near other family. So we went to Florida, and now we live with my, near my sisters and parents and grandparents, and we're making a Joy Labs East. So we're now bi-coastal, um, and we, we just hired uh, Dave Tanhave from Pinoco, the founder of Pinoco. Is, are you here, Dave? Yeah. So there he is. I'm really glad to have him on board. And uh, Todd Eddy as well, uh, who I went to high school and college with. Is he here? There he is. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, so, now, so now we work uh, decentralized from everywhere. And we sold 100,000 Makey Makeys. And here's a palette that I just got a picture of today from my manufacturer that he's sending over. And... Um, a lot of stuff is going on, and um, it turns out that if you design for tinkerability and design for the wild human in people, that, uh, that it also really sells a lot, uh, even if you just meant for it to be a project and not a product and not a business. Um, and so I would say, uh, what does it mean for you to be alive? What does it mean for you to be wild? What do you think... Um, alivens your spirit, and how can you design products or situations or schools for people in the way that that makes sense to you? Because that's the world I want to live in, one where uh, all the people in this room who design products and learning situations design them for the thing that makes them most alive. And then the people come to those events and use those products, and they feel that aliveness too. And then I'm really a happy guy. Thank you.